This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 12. All around everything was still as far as the ear could reach. The mist of his feeling shifted between us as if disturbed by his struggles, and in the rifts of the immaterial veil he would appear to my staring eyes distinct of form and pregnant with vague appeal, like a symbolic figure in a picture. The chill air of the night seemed to lie on my limbs as heavy as a slab of marble. "'I see,' I murmured, more to prove to myself that I could break my state of numbness than for any other reason. "'The Avondale picked us up just before sunset,' he remarked moodily. "'Steamed right straight for us. We had only to sit and wait.' After a long interval, he said, "'They told their story.' And again there was that oppressive silence. "'Then only I knew what it was I had made up my mind to,' he added. "'You said nothing,' I whispered. "'What could I say?' he asked in the same low tone. "'Shock slight. Stop the ship. Ascertain the damage. Took measures to get the boats on without creating a panic. As the first boat was lowered, the ship went down in a squall. Sank like lead. What could be more clear?' He hung his head and more awful. His lips quivered while he looked straight into my eyes. I had jumped, hadn't I? he asked, dismayed. That's what I had to live down. The story didn't matter. He clasped his hands for an instant, glanced right and left into the gloom. It was like cheating the dead, he stammered. And there were no dead, I said. He went away from me at this. That is the only way I can describe it. In a moment I saw his back close to the balustrade. He stood there for some time, as if admiring the purity and the peace of the night. Some flowering shrub in the garden below spread its powerful scent through the damp air. He returned to me with hasty steps. "'And that did not matter,' he said, "'as stubbornly as you please.' "'Perhaps not,' I admitted. "'I began to have the notion that he was too much for me. "'After all, what did I know?' "'Dead or not dead, I could not get clear,' he said. "'I had to live, hadn't I?' "'Well, yes, if you take it that way,' I mumbled. "'I was glad, of course,' he threw out carelessly, "'with his mind fixed on something else. "'The exposure,' he pronounced slowly, and lifted his head. "'Do you know what was my first thought when I heard? I was relieved. I was relieved to learn that those shouts—' "'Did I tell you I'd heard shouts? No? Well, I did. Shouts for help, blown along with the drizzle. Imagination, I suppose. And yet I can hardly—' "'How stupid. The others did not. I, I asked them afterwards. They all said no. No?' and I was hearing them even then. I might have known, but I didn't think. I only listened. Very faint screams, day after day. Then that little half-caste chap here came up and spoke to me. The Patna, French gunboat, towed successfully to Aden. Investigation, marine office, sailor's home, arrangements made for your board and lodging. I walked along with him and I enjoyed the silence. So there had been no shouting. Imagination. I had to believe him. I could hear nothing more. I wonder how long I could have stood it. It was getting worse, too. I mean, louder. He fell into thought. And I had heard nothing. Well, so be it. But the lights, the lights did go. We did not see them. They were not there. If they had been, I would have swam back. I would have gone back and shouted alongside. I would have begged them to take me on board. 
I would have had my chance. You doubt me. How do you know how I felt? What right have you to doubt? I very nearly did it as it was. Do you understand? His voice fell. There was not a glimmer. Not a glimmer, he protested mournfully. Don't you understand that if there had been, you would not have seen me here? You see me, and you doubt. I shook my head negatively. This question of the lights being lost sight of when the boat could not have been more than a quarter of a mile from the ship was a matter for much discussion. Jim stuck to it that there was nothing to be seen after the first shower had cleared away, and the others had affirmed the same thing to the officers of the Avondale. Of course people shook their heads and smiled. One old skipper who sat near me in court tickled my ear with his white beard to murmur, "'Of course they would lie.' As a matter of fact, nobody lied, not even the chief engineer, with his story of the masthead light dropping like a match you throw down, not consciously, at least. A man with his liver in such a state might very well have seen a floating spark in the corner of his eye, when stealing a hurried glance over his shoulder. They had seen no light of any sort, though they were well within range, and they could only explain this in one way, the ship had gone down. It was obvious and comforting. The foreseen fact, coming so swiftly, had justified their haste. No wonder they did not cast about for any other explanation. Yet the true one was very simple, and as soon as Briarly suggested it, the court ceased to bother about the question. If you remember, the ship had been stopped, and was lying with her head on the course steered through the night, with her stern canted high and her bows brought low in the water through the filling of the fore-compartment. Being thus out of trim, when the squall struck her a little on the quarter, she swung her head to wind as sharply as though she had been at anchor. By this change in her position all her lights were in a very few moments shut off from the boat to the leeward. It may very well be that, had they been seen, they would have had the effect of a mute appeal that their glimmer lost in the darkness of the cloud uh, would have had the mysterious power of the human glance that can awaken the feelings of remorse and pity. It would have said, I am here, still here, and what more can the eye of the most forsaken human being say? But she turned her back on them as if in disdain of their fate, she had swung round, burdened, to glare stubbornly at the new danger of the open sea, which she so strangely survived to the end of her days in a breaking-up yard, as if it had been her recorded fate to die obscurely under the blows of many hammers. What were the various ends their destiny provided for the pilgrims I am unable to say, but the immediate future brought at about nine o'clock the next morning a French gunboat homeward bound from Réunion. The report of her commander was public property. He had swept a little out of his course to ascertain what was the matter with that steamer floating dangerously by the head upon a still and hazy sea. There was an ensign, Union Down, flying at her main gaff. The serang had the sense to make a signal of distress at daylight but the cooks were preparing the food in the cooking-boxes forward as usual. The decks were packed as close as a sheep-pen. There were people perched all along the rails, jammed on the bridge in a solid mass. Hundreds of eyes stared, and not a sound was heard when the gunboat ranged abreast, as if all that multitude of lips had been sealed by a spell. The Frenchman hailed, could get no intelligible reply, and after ascertaining through his binoculars that the crowd on deck did not look plague-stricken, decided to send a boat. Two officers came on board, listened to the serang, tried to talk with the Arab, couldn't make head or tail of it, but of course the nature of the emergency was obvious enough. They were also very much struck by discovering a white man, dead and curled up peacefully on the bridge. Fort intrigue par ce cadavre as I was informed a long time after by an elderly French lieutenant whom I came across one afternoon in Sydney, by the merest chance, in a sort of café, who remembered the affair perfectly. 
Indeed, this affair, I may notice in passing, had an extraordinary power of defying the shortness of memories and the length of time. It seemed to live with a sort of uncanny vitality in the minds of men, on the tips of their tongues. I've had the questionable pleasure of meeting it often, years afterwards, thousands of miles away, emerging from the remotest possible talk, coming to the surface of the most distant allusions. Has it not turned up to-night between us? And I am the only seaman here. I am the only one to whom it is a memory, and yet it has made its way out. But if two men who, unknown to each other, knew of this affair, met accidentally on any spot of this earth, the thing would pop up between them as sure as fate before they parted. I had never seen that Frenchman before, and at the end of an hour we had done with each other for life. He did not seem particularly talkative, either. He was a quiet, massive chap with a creased uniform, sitting drowsily over a tumbler half full of some dark liquid. His shoulder-straps were a bit tarnished, his clean-shaved cheeks were large and sallow. He looked like a man who would be given to taking snuff, don't you know? I won't say he did, but the habit would have fitted that kind of man. It all began by his handing me a number of the home news, which I didn't want, across the marble table. I said, Merci. We exchanged a few apparently innocent remarks, and suddenly, before I knew how it had come about, we were in the midst of it, and he was telling me how much they had been intrigued by that corpse. It turned out he had been one of the boarding officers. In the establishment where we sat, one could get a variety of foreign drinks, which were kept for the visiting naval officers, and he took a sip of the dark medical-looking stuff, which probably was nothing more nasty than cassis à l'eau, and glancing with one eye into the tumbler, shook his head slightly. "'Impossible de comprendre, vous concevez he said, with a curious mixture of unconcern and thoughtfulness. I could very easily conceive how impossible it had been for them to understand. Nobody in the gunboat knew enough English to get hold of the story as told by the serang. There was a good deal of noise, too, round the two officers. They crowded upon us. There was a circle round that dead man, autour de ce mort, he described. One had to attend to the most pressing. These people were beginning to agitate themselves, parbleu, a mob like that, uh, don't you see? He interjected with philosophic indulgence. As to the bulkhead, he had advised his commander that the safest thing was to leave it alone. It was so villainous to look at. They got two hawsers on board promptly, en total, and took the patna in tow, stern foremost at that, which, under the circumstances, was not so foolish, since the rudder was too much out of the water to be of any great use for steering, and this manoeuvre eased the strain on the bulkhead, whose state, he expounded with stolid glibness, demanded the greatest care, exige les plus grands managements. I could not help thinking that my new acquaintance must have had a voice in most of these arrangements. He looked a reliable officer, no longer very active, and he was seamanlike, too, in a way, though as he sat there with his thick fingers clasped lightly on his stomach, he reminded you of one of those snuffy, quiet village priests into whose ears are poured the sins, the sufferings, the remorse of peasant generations, on whose faces the placid and simple expression is like a veil thrown over the mystery of pain and distress. He ought to have had a threadbare black soutane buttoned smoothly up to his ample chin, instead of a frock-coat with shoulder-straps and brass buttons. His broad bosom heaved regularly, while he went on telling me that it had been the very devil of a job, as doubtless, sans doubt, I could figure to myself in my quality of a seaman, en votre qualité de marin. At the end of the period he inclined his body slightly towards me, and, pursing his shaved lips, 
allowed the air to escape with a gentle hiss. Luckily, he continued, the sea was level like this table, and there was no more wind than there is here. The place struck me as indeed intolerably stuffy and very hot. My face burned as though I had been young enough to be embarrassed and blushing. They had directed their course, he pursued, to the nearest English port, naturellement, where their responsibility ceased, Dieu merci. He blew out his flat cheeks a little. Because, mind you, note bien, all the time of towing we had two quartermasters stationed with axes by the hawsers to cut us clear of our tow in case she... Uh, he fluttered downward, his heavy eyelids, making his meaning as plain as possible. What would you? One does what one can. En fait ce qu'on peut. And, for the moment, he managed to invest his ponderous immobility with an air of resignation. Two quartermasters, thirty hours, always there. Two, he repeated, lifting his right hand a little, and exhibiting two fingers. This was absolutely the first gesture I saw him make. It gave me the opportunity to note a starred scar on the back of his hand, effect of a gunshot, clearly, and as if my sight had been made more acute by this discovery, I perceived also the seam of an old wound beginning a little below the temple and going out of sight under the short grey hair at the side of his head, the graze of a spear or the cut of a sabre. He clasped his hands on his stomach again. I remained on board that, uh, that, uh, my memory is going, s'en va. Ah, Patna, c'est bien ça, Patna, merci. It is droll how one forgets. I stayed on that ship thirty hours. You did? I exclaimed, still gazing at his hands. He pursed his lips a little, but this time made no hissing sound. It was judged proper, he said, lifting his eyebrows dispassionately, that one of the officers should remain to keep an eye open. Poor ouvrier le. He sighed idly. And for communicating by signals with the towing ship, do you see, and so on. For the rest it was my opinion, too. We made our boats ready to drop over, and I also on that ship took measures. Enfin, one has done one's possible. It was a delicate position. Thirty hours. They prepared me some food. As for the wine, go and whistle for it. Not a drop. In some extraordinary way, without any marked change in his inert attitude and the placid expression of his face, he managed to convey the idea of profound disgust. I, you know, when it comes to eating without my glass of wine, I am nowhere. I was afraid he would enlarge upon the grievance, for though he didn't stir a limb or twitch a feature, he made one aware how much he was irritated by the recollection. But he seemed to forget all about it. They delivered their charge to the port authorities, as he expressed it. He was struck by the calmness with which it had been received. One might have thought they had such a droll find, droll de trouvé, brought them every day. You are extraordinary, you others, he commented, with his back propped against the wall, and looking himself as incapable of an emotional display as a sack of meal. There happened to be a man-of-war in an Indian marine steamer in the harbour at the time, and he did not conceal his admiration of the efficient manner in which the boats of these two ships cleared the patna of her passengers. Indeed, his torpid demeanour concealed nothing. It had that mysterious, almost miraculous power of producing striking effects by means impossible of detection, which is the last word of the highest art. Twenty-five minutes. Watch in hand. Twenty-five. No more. He unclasped and clasped again his fingers, without removing his hands from his stomach, and made it infinitely more effective than if he had thrown up his arms to heaven in amazement. 
all that lot to Simon on shore with their little affairs nobody left but a guard of seamen marins de l'etat and that interesting corpse cet intéressant cadavre twenty-five minutes with downcast eyes and his head tilted slightly on one side he seemed to roll knowingly on his tongue the savour of a smart bit of work he persuaded one without any further demonstration that his approval was eminently worth having and resuming his hardly interrupted immobility went on to inform me that being under orders to make the best of their way to toulon they left in two hours time so that de sorquet there are many things in this incident of my life dans ces episodes de ma vie which have remained obscure End of chapter twelve This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 13. After these words, and without a change of attitude, he, so to speak, submitted himself passively to a state of silence. I kept him company, and suddenly, but not abruptly, as if the appointed time had arrived for his moderate and husky voice to come out of his immobility, he pronounced, Mon Dieu, how the time passes. Nothing could have been more commonplace than this remark, but its utterance coincided for me with a moment of vision. It's extraordinary how we go through life with eyes half shut, with dull ears, with dormant thoughts. Perhaps it's just as well, and it may be that it is this very dullness that makes life to the incalculable majority so supportable and so welcome. Nevertheless, there can be but few of us who had never known one of these rare moments of awakening when we see, hear, understand ever so much, everything, in a flash, before we fall back again into our agreeable somnolence. I raised my eyes when he spoke, and I saw him as though I had never seen him before. I saw his chin sink on his breast, the clumsy folds of his coat, his clasped hands, his motionless pose, so curiously suggestive of his having been simply left there. Time had passed, indeed. It had overtaken him and gone ahead. It had left him hopelessly behind with a few poor gifts, the iron-gray hair, the heavy fatigue of the tanned face, two scars, a pair of tarnished shoulder-straps, one of those steady, reliable men who are the raw material of great reputations, one of those uncounted lives that are buried without drums and trumpets under the foundations of monumental successes. I am now third lieutenant of the Victorieuse. She was the flagship of the French Pacific Squadron at the time, he said, uh, detaching his shoulders from the wall a couple of inches to introduce himself. I bowed slightly on my side of the table, and told him I commanded a merchant vessel at present anchored in Rushcutter's Bay. He had remarked her, a pretty little craft. He was very civil about it in his impassive way. I even fancy he went the length of tilting his head in compliment as he repeated, breathing visibly the while, Ah, yes, a little craft painted black. Very pretty, very pretty. Très coquette. After a time he twisted his body slowly to face the glass door on our right. A dull town. Tristeville, he observed, staring into the street. It was a brilliant day. A southerly buster was raging, and we could see the passers-by, men and women, buffeted by the winds on the sidewalks, the sunlit fronts of the houses across the road, blurred by the tall whirls of dust. I descended on shore, he said, to stretch my legs a little. But... Uh, 
He didn't finish, and sank into the depths of his repose. "'Pray, tell me,' he began, coming up ponderously, "'what was there at the bottom of this affair, precisely, au juste? "'It is curious, that dead man, for instance, and so on.' "'There were living men, too,' I said, "'much more curious.' "'No doubt, no doubt,' he agreed, half audibly, and then, as if after mature consideration, murmured, "'Evidently. "'I made no difficulty in communicating to him what had interested me most in the affair. "'It seemed as though he had a right to know. "'Hadn't he spent thirty hours on board the Patna? Uh, "'Had he not taken the succession, so to speak? "'Had he not done his possible?' He listened to me, looking more priest-like than ever, and with what, probably on account of his downcast eyes, had the appearance of devout concentration. Once or twice he elevated his eyebrows, but without raising his eyelids, as one would say, the devil. Once he calmly exclaimed, Ah, bah, under his breath, and when I had finished he pursed his lips in a deliberate way, and emitted a sort of sorrowful whistle. In any one else it might have been an evidence of boredom, a sign of indifference, but he, in his occult way, managed to make his immobility appear profoundly responsive, and as full of valuable thoughts as an egg is of meat. What he said at last was nothing more than a very interesting, pronounced politely, and not much above a whisper, before I got over my disappointment, he added, but as if speaking to himself, "'That's it. That is it.' His chin seemed to sink lower on his breast, his body to weigh heavier on his seat. I was about to ask him what he meant, when a sort of preparatory tremor passed over his whole person, as a faint ripple may be seen upon stagnant water even before the wind is felt." And so that poor young man ran away, along with the others, he said, with grave tranquillity. I don't know what made me smile. It is the only genuine smile of mine I can remember in connection with Jim's affair. But somehow this simple statement of the matter sounded funny in French. C'est enfui avec l'autre, had said the lieutenant and suddenly I began to admire the discrimination of the man. He had made out the point at once. He did get hold of the only thing I cared about. I felt as though I were taking professional opinion on the case. His imperturbable and mature calmness was that of an expert in possession of the facts, and to whom one's perplexities are mere child's play. "'Ah, the young, the young,' he said indulgently. "'And, after all, one does not die of it.' "'Die of what?' I asked swiftly. "'Of being afraid.' He elucidated his meaning and sipped his drink. I perceived that the three last fingers of his wounded hand were stiff and could not move independently of each other, so that he took up his tumbler with an ungainly clutch. "'One is always afraid.' One may talk, but... He put down the glass awkwardly. The fear, the fear, look you, it is always there. He touched his breast near a brass button, on the very spot where Jim had given a thump to his own when protesting that there was nothing the matter with his heart. I suppose I made some sign of dissent, because he insisted, Oh, yes, yes! One talks, one talks. This is all very fine. But at the end of the reckoning, one is no cleverer than the next man, and no more brave. Brave. This is always to be seen. I have rolled my hump, roulé ma boss, he said, using the slang expression with imperturbable seriousness, in all parts of the world. I have known brave men, famous ones, aye. He drank carelessly. Brave, you conceive, in the service. 
one has got to be the trade demands it le metier vu ça is it not so he appealed to me reasonably eh bien each of them i say each of them if he were an honest man bien entendu would confess that there is a point there is a point for the best of us there is somewhere a point when you let go everything vous lâchez tout and you have got to live with that truth do you see given a certain combination of circumstances fear is sure to come abominable funk un trac épouvantable and even for those who do not believe this truth there is fear all the same the fear of themselves absolutely so trust me yes yes at my age one knows what one is talking about que diable he had delivered himself of all this as immovably as though he had been the mouthpiece of abstract wisdom but at this point he heightened the effect of detachment by beginning to twirl his thumb slowly it's evident parbleu he continued for make up your mind as much as you like even a simple headache or a fit of indigestion un derangement de stomac is enough to take me for instance i have made my proofs eh bien i who am speaking to you once he drained his glass and returned to his twirling no no one does not die of it he pronounced finally and when i found he did not mean to proceed with the personal anecdote i was extremely disappointed the more so as it was not the sort of story you know one could very well press him for i sat silent and he too as if nothing could please him better even his thumbs were still now suddenly his lips began to move that is so he resumed placidly man is born a coward l'homme est né poltron it is a difficulty parbleu it would be too easy otherwise but habit habit necessity do you see the eye of others voila one puts up with it and then the example of others who are no better than yourself and yet make good countenance his voice ceased that young man you will observe had none of these inducements at least at that moment i remarked he raised his eyebrows forgivingly i don't say i don't say the young man in question might have had the best dispositions the best dispositions he repeated wheezing a little i am glad to see you taking a lenient view i said his own feeling in the matter was uh, hopeful and the shuffle of his feet under the table interrupted me he drew up his heavy eyelids drew up i say no other expression can describe the steady deliberation of the act and at last was disclosed completely to me I was confronted by two narrow grey circlets, like two tiny steel rings around the profound blackness of the pupils. The sharp glance, coming from that massive body, gave a notion of extreme efficiency like the razor-edge on a battle-axe. Pardon, he said, punctiliously. His right hand went up, and he swayed forward. Allow me i contended that one may get on knowing very well that one's courage does not come of itself ne vient pas tout seul there's nothing much in that to get upset about one truth the more ought not to make life impossible but the honour the honour monsieur the honour that is real that is and what life may be worth when he got on his feet with a ponderous impetuosity, as a startled ox might scramble up from the grass. When the honour is gone, ah, ça, par exemple, I can offer no opinion. I can offer no opinion because, monsieur, I know nothing of it. I had risen, too, 
and trying to throw infinite politeness into our attitudes, we faced each other mutely, like two china dogs on a mantelpiece. Hang the fellow! He had pricked the bubble. The blight of futility that lies in wait for men's speeches had fallen upon our conversation, and made it a thing of empty sounds. "'Very well,' I said, with a disconcerted smile. "'But couldn't it reduce itself to not being found out?' He made as if to retort readily, but when he spoke he had changed his mind. <laughs> this monsieur is too fine for me, much above me. I don't think about it. He bowed heavily over his cap, which he held before him by the peak, between thumb and forefinger of his wounded hand. I bowed, too. We bowed together. So we scraped our feet at each other with much ceremony, while a dirty specimen of a waiter looked on critically as though he had paid for the performance. Serviteur, said the Frenchman. Another scrape. Monsieur? Monsieur? The glass door swung behind his burly back. I saw the southerly buster get hold of him and drive him downwind with his hand to his head, his shoulders braced, and the tails of his coat blown hard against his leg. I sat down again, alone and discouraged, discouraged about Jim's case. If you wonder that after more than three years it had preserved its actuality, you must know that I had seen him only very lately. I had come straight from Samarang, where I had loaded a cargo for Sydney, an utterly uninteresting bit of business, what Charlie here would call one of my rational transactions, and in Samarang I had seen something of Jim, he was then working for de Jong on my recommendation, water clerk, my representative afloat, as de Jong called him. You can't imagine a mode of life more barren of consolation, less capable of being invested with a spark of glamour, unless it be the business of an insurance canvasser. Little Bob Stanton, Charlie here, knew him well, had gone through that experience the same who got drowned afterwards trying to save a lady's maid in the Sephora disaster. A case of collision on a hasty morning off the Spanish coast, you may remember. All the passengers had been packed tidily into the boats and shoved clear of the ship when Bob sheered alongside again and scrambled back on deck to fetch that girl. How she had been left behind I can't make out. Anyhow, she had gone completely crazy. Wouldn't leave the ship held to the rail like grim death. The wrestling match could be seen plainly from the boats, but poor Bob was the shortest chief mate in the merchant service, and the woman stood five feet ten in her shoes and was strong as a horse, I've been told. So it went on, pull devil, pull baker, the wretched girl screaming all the time, and Bob letting out a yell now and then to warn his boat to keep well clear of the ship. One of the hands told me, hiding a smile at the recollection, it was for all the world, sir, like a naughty youngster fighting with his mother. The same old chap had said that at the last we could see that Mr. Stanton had given up hauling at the gal and just stood by looking at her, watchful-like. We thought afterwards he must have been reckoning that maybe the rush of water would tear her away from the rail by and by and give him a show to save her. We daren't come alongside for our life, and after a bit the old ship went down, all of a sudden, with a lurch to starboard. Plop! The suck-in was something awful. We never saw anything alive or dead come up. Poor Bob's spell of shore life had been one of the complications of a love affair, I believe. He fondly hoped he had done with the sea forever, and made sure he had got hold of all the bliss on earth. But it came to canvassing in the end. Some cousin of his in Liverpool put up to it. He used to tell us his experiences in that line. He made us laugh till we cried, and not altogether displeased at the effect. Undersized and bearded to the waist like a gnome, he would tiptoe amongst us and say, "'It's all very well for you beggars to laugh, but my immortal soul was shriveled down to the size of a parched pea after a week of that work.' I don't know how Jim's soul accommodated itself to the new conditions of his life. I was kept too busy in getting him something to do that would keep body and soul together. 
but I am pretty certain his adventurous fancy was suffering all the pangs of starvation. It had certainly nothing to feed upon in its new calling. It was distressing to see him at it, though he tackled it with a stubborn serenity for which I must give him full credit. I kept my eye on his shabby plodding with a sort of notion that it was a punishment for the heroics of his fancy, an expiation for his craving after more glamour than he could carry. He had loved too well to imagine himself a glorious racehorse, and now he was condemned to toil without honour like a costermonger's donkey. He did it very well. He shut himself in, put his head down, said never a word. Very well, very well indeed, except for certain fantastic and violent outbreaks on the deplorable occasions when the irrepressible Patna case cropped up. Unfortunately, that scandal of the eastern seas would not die out, and this is the reason why I could never feel I had done with Jim for good. I sat thinking of him after the French lieutenant had left, not, however, in connection with de Jong's cool and gloomy back-shop, where we had hurriedly shaken hands not very long ago, but as I had seen him years before in the last flickers of the candle, alone with me in the long gallery of the Malabar house, with the chill and the darkness of the night at his back. The respectable sword of his country's law was suspended over his head, Tomorrow, or was it today? Midnight had slipped by long before we parted. The marble-faced police magistrate, after distributing fines and terms of imprisonment in the assault and battery case, would take up the awful weapon and smite his bowed neck. Our communion in the night was uncommonly like a last vigil with a condemned man. He was guilty, too. He was guilty, as I have told myself repeatedly, guilty and done for. Nevertheless, I wished to spare him the mere detail of a formal execution. I don't pretend to explain the reasons of my desire. I don't think I could. But if you haven't got a sort of notion by this time, then I must have been very obscure in my narrative, or you too sleepy to seize upon the sense of my words. I don't defend my morality. There was no morality in the impulse which induced me to lay before him Briarly's plan of evasion, if I may call it, in all its primitive simplicity. There were the rupees, absolutely ready in my pocket and very much at his service. Oh, alone, alone, of course. And if an introduction to a man in Rangoon could, who could put some work in his way, why, with the greatest pleasure, I had pen, ink, and paper in my room on the first floor and even while I was speaking I was impatient to begin the letter, day, month, year, 2.30 a.m., for the sake of our old friendship I ask you to put some work in the way of Mr. James so-and-so, in whom, etc., etc. I was even ready to write in that strain about him. If he had not enlisted my sympathies, he had done better for himself. He had gone to the very fount and origin of that sentiment. He had reached the secret sensibility of my egoism. I am concealing nothing from you, because were I to do so, my action would appear more unintelligible than any man's action has the right to be, and, in the second place, to-morrow you will forget my sincerity along with the other lessons of the past. In this transaction, to speak grossly and precisely, I was the irreproachable man, but the subtle intentions of my immorality were defeated by the moral simplicity of the criminal. No doubt he was selfish too, but his selfishness had a higher origin, a more lofty aim. I discovered that, say what I would, he was eager to go through the ceremony of execution, and I didn't say much, for I felt that an argument with his youth would tell against me heavily. He believed where I had already ceased to doubt. There was something fine in the wildness of his unexpressed, hardly formulated hope. "'Clear out! Couldn't think of it,' he said, with a shake of his head. "'I make you an offer for which I neither demand nor expect any sort of gratitude,' I said. "'You shall repay the money when convenient, and awfully good of you,' he muttered, without looking up. I watched him narrowly. 
the future must have appeared horribly uncertain to him. But he did not falter, as though indeed there had been nothing wrong with his heart. I felt angry, not for the first time that night. "'The whole wretched business,' I said, "'is bitter enough, I should think, for a man of your kind.' "'It is. It is,' he whispered twice, with his eyes fixed on the floor. It was heart-rending. He towered above the light, and I could see the down on his cheek, the colour mantling warm under the smooth skin of his face. Believe me or not, I say it was outrageously heart-rending. It provoked me to brutality. "'Yes,' I said, and allow me to confess that I am totally unable to imagine what advantage you can expect from this licking of the dregs. Advantage, he murmured out of his stillness. I am dashed if I do, I said, enraged. I've been trying to tell you all there is in it, he went on slowly, as if meditating something unanswerable. But, after all, it is my trouble. I opened my mouth to retort, and discovered suddenly that I'd lost all confidence in myself, and it was as if he too had given me up, for he mumbled like a man thinking half aloud, went away, went into hospitals. Not one of them would face it. They. He moved his hand slightly to imply disdain. But I've got to get over this thing, and I mustn't shirk any of it, or— I won't shirk any of it. He was silent. He gazed as though he had been haunted. His unconscious face reflected the passing expressions of scorn, of despair, of resolution, reflected them in turn, as a magic mirror would reflect the gliding passage of unearthly shapes. He lived surrounded by deceitful ghosts, by austere shades. "'Oh, nonsense, my dear fellow,' I began. He had a movement of impatience. "'You don't seem to understand,' he said incisively, then looking at me without a wink. "'I may have jumped, but I don't run away.' "'I meant no offence, I said, and added stupidly, "'Better men than you have found it expedient to run at times.' He coloured all over, while in my confusion I half choked myself with my own tongue. "'Perhaps so.' he said at last. I am not good enough. I can't afford it. I am bound to fight this thing down. I am fighting it now. I got out of my chair and felt stiff all over. The silence was embarrassing, and to put an end to it I imagined nothing better but to remark, oh, I had no idea it was so late, in an airy tone. I dare say you have had enough of this, he said brusquely and to tell you the truth, he began to look round for his hat. So have I. Well, he had refused this unique offer. He had struck aside my helping hand. He was ready to go now, and beyond the balustrade the night seemed to wait for him very still, as though he had been marked down for its prey. I heard his voice. Ah, here it is. He had found his hat. For a few seconds we hung in the wind. "'What will you do after—' uh, "'After—' I asked, very low. "'Go to the dogs, as likely as not,' he answered in a gruff mutter. I had recovered my wits in a measure, and judged it best to take it lightly. "'Pray remember,' I said, "'that I should like very much to see you again before you go. "'I don't know what's to prevent you. "'The damn thing won't make me invisible.' he said, with intense bitterness. No such luck. And then, at the moment of taking leave, he treated me to a ghastly muddle of dubious stammers and movements, to an awful display of hesitations. God forgive him, me! He had taken it into his fanciful head that I was likely to make some difficulty as to shaking hands. It was too awful for words. I believe I shouted suddenly at him, as you would bellow to a man you saw about to walk over a cliff. I remember our voices being raised, the appearance of a miserable grin on his face, a crushing clutch on my hand, a nervous laugh. The candle spluttered out, and the thing was over at last. 
with a groan that floated up to me in the dark. He got himself away somehow. The night swallowed his form. He was a horrible bungler. Horrible. I heard the quick crunch-crunch of the gravel under his boots. He was running, absolutely running, with nowhere to go to. And he was not yet four and twenty. End of chapter 13「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapter 14 I slept little, hurried over my breakfast, and after a slight hesitation gave up my early morning visit to my ship. It was really very wrong of me, because though my chief mate was an excellent man all round, he was the victim of such black imaginings that if he did not get a letter from his wife at the expected time, he would go quite distracted with rage and jealousy, lose all grip on the work, quarrel with all hands, and either weep in his cabin or develop such a ferocity of temper as all but drove the crew to the verge of mutiny. A thing had always seemed inexplicable to me. They had been married thirteen years. I had a glimpse of her once, and honestly I couldn't conceive a man abandoned enough to plunge into sin for the sake of such an unattractive person. I don't know whether I have done wrong by refraining from putting that view before poor Selvin. The man made a little hell on earth for himself, and I also suffered indirectly. But some sort of no doubt false delicacy prevented me. The marital relations of seamen would make an interesting subject, and I could tell you instances. However, this is not the place nor the time, and we are concerned with Jim, who was unmarried. If his imaginative conscience or his pride, if all the extravagant ghosts and austere shades that were the disastrous familiars of his youth would not let him run away from the block, I, who of course can't be suspected of such familiars, was irresistibly impelled to go and see his head roll off. I wended my way towards the court. I didn't hope to be very much impressed or edified or interested or even frightened. Though, as long as there is any life before one, a jolly good fright now and then is a salutary discipline. But neither did I expect to be so awfully depressed. The bitterness of his punishment was in its chill and mean atmosphere. The real significance of crime is in its being a breach of faith with the community of mankind, and from that point of view he was no mean traitor but his execution was a hole-and-corner affair. There was no high scaffolding, no scarlet cloth. Did they have scarlet cloth on Tower Hill? <laughs> they should have had. No awe-stricken multitude to be horrified at his guilt and be moved to tears at his fate. No air of sombre retribution. There was, as I walked along, the clear sunshine, a brilliance too passionate to be consoling, the streets full of jumbled bits of colour like a damaged kaleidoscope, yellow, green, blue, dazzling white, the brown nudity of an undraped shoulder, a bullock cart with a red canopy, a company of native infantry in a drab body with dark heads, marching in dusty laced boots, a native policeman in a sombre uniform of scanty cut and belted in patent leather, who looked up at me with orientally pitiful eyes, as though his migrating spirit were suffering exceedingly from that unforeseen, uh, what do you call him, avatar, incarnation. Under the shade of a lonely tree in the courtyard, the villagers connected with the assault case sat in a picturesque group, looking like a chromolithograph of a camp in a book on eastern travel. One missed the obligatory thread of smoke in the foreground and the pack animals grazing. A blank yellow wall rose behind, overtopping the tree, reflecting the glare. The courtroom was sombre, 
seemed more vast. High up in the dim space the punkas were swaying short to and fro, to and fro. Here and there a draped figure, dwarfed by bare walls, remained without stirring amongst the rows of empty benches, as if absorbed in pious meditation. The plaintiff, who had been beaten, an obese chocolate-coloured man with shaved head, one fat breast bare with a bright yellow cast-mark above the bridge of his nose, sat in pompous immobility. Only his eyes glittered, rolling in the gloom, and the nostrils dilated and collapsed violently as he breathed. Briarly dropped into his seat, looking done up, as though he had spent the night in sprinting on a cinder-track. The pious sailing-ship skipper appeared excited, and made uneasy movements, as if restraining with difficulty an impulse to stand up and exhort us earnestly to prayer and repentance. The head of the magistrate, delicately pale under the neatly arranged hair, resembled the head of a hopeless invalid after he had been washed and brushed and propped up in bed. He moved aside the vase of flowers, a bunch of purple with a few pink blossoms on long stalks, and seizing in both hands a long sheet of bluish paper, ran his eye over it, propped his forearms on the edge of the desk, and began to read aloud in an even, distinct, and careless voice. By Jove! For all my foolishness about scaffolds and heads rolling off, I assure you it was infinitely worse than a beheading. A heavy sense of finality brooded over all of this, unrelieved by the hope of rest and safety following the fall of the axe. These proceedings had all the cold vengefulness of a death sentence and the cruelty of a sentence in exile. This is how I looked at it that morning, and even now I seem to see an undeniable vestige of truth in that exaggerated view of a common occurrence. You may imagine how strongly I felt this at the time. Perhaps it is for that reason that I could not bring myself to admit the finality. The thing was always with me. I was always eager to take opinion on it, as though it had not been practically settled. Individual opinion, international opinion, by Jove. That Frenchman's, for instance. His own country's pronouncement was uttered in the passionless and definite phraseology a machine would use, if machines could speak. The head of the magistrate was half hidden by the paper. His brow was like alabaster. There were several questions before the court, the first as to whether the ship was in every respect fit and seaworthy for the voyage. The court found she was not. The next point, I remember, was whether, up to the time of the accident, the ship had been navigated with proper and seamanlike care. They said yes to that, goodness knows why, and then they declared that there was no evidence to show the exact cause of the accident. A floating derelict, probably. I myself remember that a Norwegian bark bound out with a cargo of pitch-pine had been given up as missing about that time, and it was just the sort of craft that would capsize in a squall and float bottom-up for months, a kind of maritime ghoul on the prowl to kill ships in the dark. Such wandering corpses are common enough in the North Atlantic, which is haunted by all the terrors of the sea fogs, icebergs, dead ships bent upon mischief, and long sinister gales that fasten upon one like a vampire till all the strength and the spirit and even hope are gone, and one feels like the empty shell of a man. But there, in those seas, the incident was rare enough to resemble a special arrangement of malevolent providence, which, unless it had for its object the killing of a donkey-man and the bringing of worse than death upon Jim, appeared an utterly aimless piece of devilry. This view occurring to me took off my attention. For a time I was aware of the magistrate's voice, as a sound merely, but in a moment it shaped itself into distinct words. In utter disregard of their plain duty, it said, the next sentence escaped me somehow, and then, abandoning in the moment of danger the lives and property confided to their charge, went on the voice evenly, and stopped. 
A pair of eyes under the white forehead shot darkly a glance above the edge of the paper. I looked for Jim hurriedly, as though I had expected him to disappear. He was very still, but he was there. He sat, pink and fair and extremely attentive. Therefore, began the voice emphatically, he stared with parted lips hanging upon the words of the man behind the desk. These came out into the stillness wafted on the wind made by the punkas, and I, watching for their effect upon him, caught only the fragments of official language. The court, Gustav so-and-so, master, native of Germany, James so-and-so, mate, certificates cancelled. A silence fell. The magistrate had dropped the paper, and leaning sideways on the arm of his chair, began to talk with Briarly, easily. People started to move out. Others were pushing in. And I also made for the door. Outside I stood still, and when Jim passed me on his way to the gate, I caught at his arm and detained him. The look he gave discomposed me, as though I had been responsible for his state. He looked at me as if I had been the embodied evil of life. "'It's all over,' I stammered. "'Yes,' he said thickly. "'And now let no man—' He jerked his arm out of my grasp. I watched his back as he went away. It was a long street, and he remained in sight for some time. He walked rather slow, and straddling his legs a little— as if he had found it difficult to keep a straight line. Just before I lost him, I fancied he staggered a bit. "'Men overboard,' said a deep voice behind me. Turning round, I saw a fellow I knew slightly, a West Australian. Chester was his name. He, too, had been looking after Jim. He was a man with an immense girth of chest, a rugged, clean-shaved face of mahogany colour, and two blunt tufts of iron-gray, thick, wiry hairs on his upper lip. He had been a purler, wrecker, trader, whaler, too, I believe. In his own words, anything and everything a man may be at sea but a pirate. The Pacific, north and south, was his proper hunting-ground, but he had wandered so far afield looking for a cheap steamer to buy. Lately he had discovered, so he said, a guano island somewhere, but its approaches were dangerous, and the anchorage, such as it was, could not be considered safe, to say the least of it. "'As good as a gold mine,' he would exclaim, "'right bang in the middle of the Walpole reefs, and if it's true enough that you can't get no holding ground anywhere in less than forty fathom, then what of that? There are the hurricanes, too. But it's a first-rate thing, as good as a gold mine, better. Yet there's not a fool of them that will see it. I can't get a skipper or a ship-owner to go near the place. So I made up my mind to cart the blessed stuff myself. Uh, this was what he required a steamer for, and I knew he was just then negotiating enthusiastically with a Parsee firm for an old brig-rigged sea anachronism of ninety horsepower. We had met and spoken together several times. He looked knowingly after Jim. "'Takes it to hot? he asked scornfully. "'Very much,' I said. "'Then he's no good,' he opined. "'What's all the to-do about? "'A bit of ass's skin. "'That never yet made a man. "'You must see things exactly as they are. "'If you don't, you may as well just give in at once. "'You will never do anything in this world. "'Look at me. "'I made it a practice never to take anything to heart.' "'Yes,' I said. "'You see things as they are.' "'I wish I could see my partner coming along. "'That's what I wish I could see,' he said. "'Now my partner, old Robinson? "'Yes, the Robinson. "'Don't you know? "'The notorious Robinson. "'The man who smuggled more opium "'and begged more seals in his time "'than any loose Johnny now alive. "'They say he used to board the sealing schooners "'up Alaska way when the fog was so thick "'that the Lord God, he alone, "'could tell one man from another.' "'Holy Terror Robinson, that's the man. "'He is with me in that guano thing. "'The best chance he ever came across in his life.' "'He put his lips to my ear. "'Cannibal? "'Well, they used to give him the name years and years ago. "'You remember the story? 
a shipwreck on the west side of Stewart Island. That's right. Seven of them got ashore, and it seems they did not get on very well together. Some men are too cantankerous for anything. They don't know how to make the best of a bad job. Don't see things as they are. As they are, me boy. And then what's the consequence? Obvious. Trouble. Trouble. As likely as not a knock on the head. And serve em right, too. That sword is the most useful when it's dead. A story goes that a boat of Her Majesty's ship Wolverine found him kneeling on the kelp, naked as the day he was born, and chanting some psalm tune or other. Light snow was falling at the time. He waited till the boat was an oar's length from the shore, and then up and away. They chased him for an hour up and down the boulders, till a marine flung a stone that took him behind the air providentially, and knocked him senseless. Alone? Of course. But that's like the tale of the sealing schooners. The Lord God knows the right and wrong of that story. The cutter did not investigate much. They wrapped him in a boat cloak and took him off as quick as they could, with a dark night coming on, the weather threatening, and the ship firing recall guns every five minutes. Three weeks afterwards he was as well as ever. He didn't allow any fuss that was made on shore to upset him. He just shut his lips tight and let people screech. It was bad enough to have lost his ship and all he was worth besides, without paying attention to the hard names they called him. That's the man for me. He lifted his arm for a signal to someone down the street. He's got a little money, so I had to let him into my thing. Had to. It would have been sinful to throw away such a find, and I was cleaned out myself. It cut me to the quick, but I could see the matter just as it was, and if I must share, thinks I, with any man, then give me Robinson. I left him at breakfast in the hotel to come to court, because I've an idea— Ah, good morning, Captain Robinson. Friend of mine, Captain Robinson. An emaciated patriarch in a suit of white drill, a solar topi with a green-lined rim on a head trembling with age, joined us after crossing the street in a trotting shuffle, and stood propped with both hands on the handle of an umbrella. A white beard with amber streaks hung lumpily down to his waist. He blinked his creased eyelids at me in a bewildered way. How, "'How do you do? How do you do?' he piped amiably, and tottered. "'A little deaf, said Chester, aside. "'Did you drag him over six thousand miles to get a cheap steamer?' I asked. "'I would have taken him twice round the world as soon as look at him,' said Chester, with immense energy. "'The steamer will be the making of us, my lad. "'Is it my fault that every skipper and ship-owner in the whole of blessed Australasia turns out a blind fool?' Once I talked for three hours to a man in Auckland. Send a ship, I said. Send a ship. I'll give you half of the first cargo for yourself, free, gratis, for nothing, just to make a good start. Says he, I wouldn't do it if there was no other place on earth to send a ship to. <laughs> Perfect ass, of course. Rocks, currents, no anchorage, sheer cliff to lie to. No insurance company would take the risk. Didn't see how he could get loaded under three years. Ass! I nearly went on my knees to him. But look at the thing as it is, I says. Damn rocks and hurricanes. Look at it as it is. There's guano there Queensland sugar planters would fight for. Fight for on the quay, I tell you. What can you do with a fool? That's one of your little jokes, Chester, he says. Joke! I could have whipped. Ask Captain Robinson here. And there was another ship-owning fellow, a fat chap in a white waistcoat in Wellington, who seemed to think I was up to some swindle or other. I don't know what sort of fool you're looking for, he says, but I'm busy just now. Good morning. I long to take him in my two hands and smash him through the window of his own office. But I didn't. I was as mild as a curate. Think of it, says I. Do think it over. I'll call you tomorrow. He grunted something about being out all day. On the stairs I felt ready to beat my head against the wall from vexation. Captain Robinson here can tell you. It was awful to think of all that lovely stuff lying waste under the sun. Stuff that would send the sugar cane shooting sky high. The making of Queensland. The making of Queensland. And in Brisbane, 
or I went to have a last try, they gave me the name of a lunatic. Idiots! The only sensible man I came across was the cabman who drove me about. A broken-down swell he was, I fancy. Hey, Captain Robinson, you remember I told you about my cabby in Brisbane, don't you? The chap had a wonderful eye for things. He saw it all in a jiffy. It was a real pleasure to talk with him. One evening, after a devil of a day among ship-owners, I felt so bad, says I, I must get drunk. Come along, I must get drunk or I'll go mad. I am your man, he says. Go ahead. I don't know what I would have done without him. I, Captain Robinson? He poked the ribs of his partner. He, 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 laughed the ancient, looked aimlessly down the street, then peered at me doubtfully with sad, dim pupils. He, he, he. He leaned heavier on the umbrella, and dropped his gaze on the ground. I needn't tell you I had tried to get away several times, but Chester had foiled every attempt by simply catching hold of my coat. One minute. I've a notion. What's your infernal notion? I exploded at last. If you think I'm going in with you... No, no, me boy. Too light if you want it ever so much. We've got a steamer. You've got the ghost of a steamer, I said. Good enough for a start. There's no superior nonsense about us, is there, Captain Robinson? No, 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 croaked the old man without lifting his eyes, and the senile tremble of his head became almost fierce with determination. I understand you now, that young chap, said Chester, with a nod at the street from which Jim had disappeared long ago. He's been having grub with you in the Malabar last night, so I was told. I said that was true, and after remarking that he too liked to live well and in style, only that for the present he had to be saving every penny, none too many for the business, isn't that so, Captain Robinson? He squared his shoulders and stroked his dumpy moustache, while the notorious Robinson, coughing at his side, clung more than ever to the handle of the umbrella, and seemed ready to subside passively into a heap of old bones. "'You see, the old chap has all the money,' whispered Chester confidentially. "'I've been cleaned out trying to engineer the dratted thing. "'But wait a bit, wait a bit. The good time is coming.' "'He seemed suddenly astonished at the signs of impatience I gave. "'Oh, cracky!' he cried. "'I'm telling you the biggest thing that ever was, and you—' "'I have an appointment,' I pleaded mildly. "'What of that?' he asked, with genuine surprise. "'Let it wait!' "'That's exactly what I am doing now,' I remarked. "'Hadn't you better tell me what it is you want?' "'Buy twenty hotels like that,' he growled to himself, "'and every joker boarding in them, too. Twenty times over.' He lifted his head smartly. "'I want that young chap.' "'I don't understand,' I said. "'He's no good, is he?' said Chester crisply. "'I know nothing about it,' I protested. "'Why, you yourself told me he was taking it to heart,' argued Chester. "'Well, in my opinion, a chap who—' "'Anyhow, he can't be much good. Uh, "'But then you see, I am on the lookout for somebody, "'and I've got just the thing that will suit him. "'I'll give him a job on my island.' "'He nodded significantly. "'I'm going to dump forty coolies there, "'if I've got to steal them. "'Somebody must work the stuff. "'Oh, I mean to act square. "'Wooden shed, corrugated iron roof. "'I know a man in Hobart who will take my bill "'at six months for the materials. "'I do, honour bright. "'And then there's the water supply.' I'll have to fly round and get somebody to trust me for half a dozen second-hand iron tanks. Catch Rhinewater, eh? Let him take charge. Make him a supreme boss over the coolies. Good idea, isn't it? What do you say? There are whole years when not a drop of rain falls on Walpole, I said, too amazed to laugh. He bit his lip and seemed bothered. Ah, oh, well, I will fix something up for them, or land a supply. Hang it all, that's not the question. I said nothing. I had a rapid vision of Jim perched on a shadowless rock up to his knees in guano, with the screams of seabirds in his ears, the incandescent ball of the sun above his head, the empty sky and the empty ocean all a-quiver, simmering together in the heat as far as the eye could reach. "'I wouldn't advise my worst enemy,' I began. "'What's the matter with you?' cried Chester. I mean to give him a good screw. That is, as soon as the thing is set going, of course. It's as easy as falling off a log. Simply nothing to do. Two six-shooters in his belt. 
Surely he wouldn't be afraid of anything forty coolies could do, with two six-shooters and him the only armed man, too. It's much better than it looks. I want you to help me to talk him over. No, I shouted. Old Robinson lifted his bleared eyes dismally for a moment. Chester looked at me with infinite contempt. So you wouldn't advise him? he uttered slowly. Certainly not, I answered, as indignant as though he had requested me to help murder somebody. Moreover, I'm sure he wouldn't. He's badly cut up, but he isn't mad as far as I know. He is no earthly good for anything, Chester mused aloud. He would have just done for me. If you could only see a thing as it is, you would see it's the very thing for him. And besides, why, it's the most splendid sure chance. He got angry suddenly. I must have a man! There! He stamped his foot and smiled unpleasantly. Anyhow, I could guarantee the island wouldn't sink under him, and I believe he is a bit particular on that point. Good morning, I said curtly. He looked at me as though I had been an incomprehensible fool. Must be moving, Captain Robinson, he yelled suddenly into the old man's ear. These Parsi Johnnies are waiting for us to clinch the bargain. He took his partner under the arm with a firm grip, swung him round, and unexpectedly leered at me over his shoulder. I was trying to do him a kindness, he asserted with an air and tone that made my blood boil. Thank you for nothing in his name, I rejoined. Oh, you are devilish smart, he sneered, but you are like the rest of them, too much in the clouds. See what you will do with him. I don't know that I want to do anything with him. Don't you? he spluttered. His grey moustache bristled with anger, and by his side the notorious Robinson, propped on the umbrella, stood with his back to me, as patient and still as a worn-out cab-horse. I haven't found a guano island, I said. It's my belief you wouldn't know one if you were led right up to it by the hand, he reposted quickly. And in this world you've got to see a thing first before you can make use of it. Got to see it through and through at that, neither more nor less. And get others to see it, too, I insinuated with a glance at the bowed back by his side. Chester snorted at me. His eyes are right enough. Don't you worry. He ain't a puppy. Oh, dear, no, I said. Come along, Captain Robinson, he shouted, with a sort of bullying deference under the rim of the old man's hat. The holy terror gave a submissive little jump. The ghost of a steamer was waiting for them, fortune on that fair isle. They made a curious pair of argonauts. Chester strode on leisurely, well set up, portly, and of conquering mien. The other, long-waisted, drooping, and hooked to his arm, shuffled his withered shanks with desperate haste. End of chapter 14「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapters 15, 16, and 17. Chapter 15 I did not start in search of Jim at once, only because I had really an appointment which I could not neglect. Then, as ill luck would have it, in my agent's office I was fastened upon by a fellow fresh from Madagascar with a little scheme for a wonderful piece of business. It had something to do with cattle and cartridges and a Prince Ravanalo something, but the pivot of the whole affair was the stupidity of some admiral. Admiral Pierre, I think. Everything turned on that, and the chap couldn't find words strong enough to express his confidence. He had globular eyes starting out of his head with a fishy glitter, bumps on his forehead, and wore his long hair brushed back without a parting. He had a favourite phrase which he kept on repeating triumphantly. "'The minimum of risk with the maximum of profit is my motto. What?' He made my head ache, spoiled my tiffin, but he got his own out of me all right, and as soon as I had shaken him off I made straight for the waterside. I caught sight of Jim leaning over the parapet of the quay. 
Three native boatmen quarrelling over five annas were making an awful row at his elbow. He didn't hear me come up, but spun round as if the slight contact of my finger had released a catch. I, I, I was looking, he stammered. I don't remember what I said, not much anyhow, but he made no difficulty in following me to the hotel. He followed me as manageable as a little child, with an obedient air, with no sort of manifestation, rather as though he had been waiting for me there to come along and carry him off. I need not have been so surprised as I was at his tractability, and all the round earth, which to some seems so big, and that others affect to consider as rather smaller than a mustard seed, he had no place where he could, what shall I say, where he could withdraw that's it withdraw be alone with his loneliness he walked by my side very calm glancing here and there and once turned his head to look after a city boy fireman with a cutaway coat and yellowish trousers whose black face had silky gleams like a lump of anthracite coal i doubt however whether he saw anything or even remained all the time aware of my companionship because if I had not edged him to the left here, or pulled him to the right there, I believe he would have gone straight before him in any direction till stopped by a wall or some other obstacle. I steered him into my bedroom, and sat down at once to write letters. This was the only place in the world, unless perhaps the Walpole Reef, but that was not so handy, where he could have it out with himself without being bothered by the rest of the universe. The damned thing, as he had expressed it, had not made him invisible, but I behaved exactly as though he were. No sooner in my chair I bent over my writing-desk like a medieval scribe, and, but for the movement of the hand holding the pen, remained anxiously quiet. I can't say I was frightened, but I certainly kept as still as if there had been something dangerous in the room that at the first hint of a movement on my part would be provoked to pounce upon me. There was not much in the room. You know how these bedrooms are, a sort of four-poster bedstead under a mosquito net, two or three chairs, the table I was writing at, a bare floor, a glass door opened on an upstairs veranda, and he stood with his face to it, having a hard time with all possible privacy. Dusk fell, I lit a candle with the greatest economy of movement, and as much prudence as though it were an illegal proceeding. There is no doubt that he had a very hard time of it, and so had I, even to the point, I must own, of wishing him to the devil, or on Walpole Reef, at least. It occurred to me, once or twice, that, after all, Chester was perhaps the man to deal effectively with such a disaster. That strange idealist had found a practical use for it at once, unerringly, as it were. It was enough to make one suspect that maybe he really could see the true aspect of things that appeared mysterious or utterly hopeless to less imaginative persons. I wrote and wrote. I liquidated all the arrears of my correspondence, and then went on writing to people who had no reason whatever to expect from me a gossipy letter about nothing at all. At times I stole a sidelong glance. He was rooted to the spot, but convulsive shudders ran down his back. His shoulders would heave suddenly. He was fighting, he was fighting, mostly for his breath, as it seemed. The massive shadows, cast all one way from the straight flame of the candle, seemed possessed of gloomy consciousness. The immobility of the furniture had to my furtive eye the air of attention, I was becoming fanciful in the midst of my industrious scribbling, and though, when the scratching of my pen stopped for a moment, there was complete silence and stillness in the room, I suffered from that profound disturbance and confusion of thought which is caused by a violent and menacing uproar, of a heavy gale at sea, for instance. Some of you may know what I mean, that mingled anxiety, distress, and irritation, with a sort of craven feeling creeping in not pleasant to acknowledge, but which gives quite a special merit to one's endurance. I don't claim any merit for standing the stress of Jim's emotions. I could take refuge in the letters. 
I could have written to strangers if necessary. Suddenly, as I was taking up a fresh sheet of note paper, I heard a low sound. The first sound that, since we had been shut up together, had come to my ears in the dim stillness of the room. I remained with my head down, with my hand arrested. Those who have kept vigil by a sick bed have heard such faint sounds in the stillness of the night watches, sounds wrung from a racked body, from a weary soul. He pushed the glass door with such force that all the panes rang. He stepped out, and I held my breath, straining my ears without knowing what else I expected to hear. He was really taking too much to heart an empty formality, which to Chester's rigorous criticism seemed unworthy the notice of a man who could see things as they were. An empty formality, a piece of parchment. <laughs> well, well. As to an inaccessible guano deposit, that was another story altogether. One could intelligibly break one's heart over that. A feeble burst of many voices mingled with the tinkle of silver and glass floated up from the dining-room below. Through the open door, the outer edge of the light from my candle fell on his back faintly. Beyond all was black. He stood on the brink of a vast obscurity, like a lonely figure by the shore of a sombre and hopeless ocean. There was the Walpole Reef in it, to be sure, a speck in the dark void, a straw for the drowning man. My compassion for him took the shape of the thought that I wouldn't have liked his people to see him at that moment. I found it trying myself. His back was no longer shaken by his gasps. He stood straight as an arrow, faintly visible and still, and the meaning of this stillness sank to the bottom of my soul like lead into the water, and made it so heavy that for a second I wished heartily that the only course left open for me was to pay for his funeral. Even the law had done with him. To bury him would have been such an easy kindness. It would have been so much in accordance with the wisdom of life, which consists in putting out of sight all the reminders of our folly, of our weakness, of our mortality, all that makes against our efficiency, the memory of our failures, the hints of our undying fears, the bodies of our dead friends. Perhaps he did take it too much to heart. And if so, then... Chester's offer. At this point I took up a fresh sheet and began to write resolutely. There was nothing but myself between him and the dark ocean. I had a sense of responsibility. If I spoke, would that motionless and suffering youth leap into the obscurity, clutch at the straw? I found out how difficult it may be sometimes to make a sound. There is a weird power in a spoken word— and why the devil not, I was asking myself persistently while I drove on with my writing. All at once, on the blank page, under the very point of the pen, the two figures of Chester and his antique partner, very distinct and complete, would dodge into view with stride and gestures, as if reproduced in the field of some optical toy. I would watch them for a while. No, they were too phantasmal and extravagant to enter into anyone's fate. And a word carries far, very far, deals destruction through time as the bullets go flying through space. I said nothing, and he, out there, with his back to the light, as if bound and gagged by all the invisible foes of man, made no stir and made no sound. Chapter 16 the time was coming when I should see him loved, trusted, admired, with a legend of strength and prowess forming round his name as though he had been the stuff of a hero. It's true, I assure you, as true as I'm sitting here talking about him in vain. He, on his side, had that faculty of beholding at a hint the face of his desire and the shape of his dream— without which the earth would know no lover and no adventurer. He captured much honour and an Arcadian happiness, I won't say anything about innocence, in the bush, and it was as good to him as the honour and the Arcadian happiness of the streets to another man. Felicity, Felicity, how shall I say it, is quaffed out of a golden cup in every latitude, the flavour is with you, with you alone, 
and you can make it as intoxicating as you please. He was of the sort that would drink deep, as you may guess from what went before. I found him, if not exactly intoxicated, then at least flushed with the elixir at his lips. He had not obtained it at once. There had been, as you know, a period of probation amongst infernal ship-chandlers, during which he had suffered and I had worried about... Uh, about... Uh, my trust, you may call it. I don't know that I am completely reassured now after beholding him in all his brilliance. That was my last view of him, in a strong light, dominating and yet in complete accord with his surroundings, with the life of the forests and with the life of men. I own that I was impressed, but I must admit to myself that after all this is not the lasting impression. He was protected by his isolation, alone of his own superior kind, in close touch with nature, that keeps faith on such easy terms with her lovers. But I cannot fix before my eye the image of his safety. I shall always remember him as seen through the open door of my room, taking perhaps too much to heart the mere consequences of his failure. I am pleased, of course, that some good, and even some splendor, came out of my endeavors, but at times it seems to me that it would have been better for my peace of mind if I had not stood between him and Chester's confoundedly generous offer. I wonder what his exuberant imagination would have made of Walpole Islet, that most hopelessly forsaken crumb of dry land on the face of the waters. It is not likely I would ever have heard, for I must tell you that Chester, after calling at some Australian port to patch up his brig-rigged sea anachronism, steamed out into the Pacific with a crew of twenty-two hands all told, and the only news having a possible bearing upon the mystery of his fate was the news of a hurricane which is supposed to have swept in its course over the Walpole Shoals a month or so afterward. Not a vestige of the Argonauts ever turned up. Not a sound came out of the waste. Finis. The Pacific is the most discreet of live, hot-tempered oceans. The chilly Antarctic can keep a secret, too, but more in the manner of a grave. And there is a sense of blessed finality in such discretion, which is what we all more or less sincerely are ready to admit— for what else is it that makes the idea of death supportable? End. Finis, the potent word that exercises from the house of life the haunting shadow of fate. This is what, notwithstanding the testimony of my eyes and his own earnest assurances, I miss when I look back upon Jim's success. While there's life, there is hope, truly. But there is fear, too. I don't mean to say that I regret my action, nor will I pretend that I can't sleep of nights in consequence. Still, the idea obtrudes itself that he made so much of his disgrace, while it is the guilt alone that matters. He was not, if I may say so, clear to me. He was not clear. And there is a suspicion that he was not clear to himself, either. There were his fine sensibilities, his fine feelings, his fine longings, a sort of sublimated, idealized selfishness. He was, if you allow me to say so, very fine, very fine, and very unfortunate. A little coarser nature would not have borne the strain. It would have had to come to terms with itself, with a sigh, with a grunt, or even with a guffaw. A still coarser one would have remained invulnerably ignorant and completely uninteresting. But he was too interesting or too unfortunate to be thrown to the dogs, or even to Chester. I felt this while I sat with my face over the paper, and he fought and gasped, struggling for his breath in that terribly stealthy way in my room. I felt it when he rushed out on the veranda, as if to fling himself over, and didn't. I felt it more and more all the time he remained outside, faintly lighted on the background of night, as if standing on the shore of a somber and hopeless sea. 
An abrupt, heavy rumble made me lift my head. The noise seemed to roll away, and suddenly a searching and violent glare fell on the blind face of the night. The sustained and dazzling flickers seemed to last for an unconscionable time. The growl of the thunder increased steadily while I looked at him, distinct and black, planted solidly upon the shores of a sea of light. At the moment of his greatest brilliance the darkness leaped back with a culminating crash, and he vanished before my dazzled eyes as utterly as though he had been blown to atoms. A blustering sigh passed, furious hands seemed to tear at the shrubs, shake the tops of the trees below, slam doors, break window panes all along the front of the building. He stepped in, closing the door behind him, and found me bending over the table. My sudden anxiety as to what he would say was very great, and akin to a fright. "'May I have a cigarette?' he asked. I gave a push to the box without raising my head. "'I want... want... tobacco,' he muttered. I became extremely buoyant. "'Just a moment.' I grunted pleasantly. He took a few steps here and there. "'That's over.' I heard him say. A single distant clap of thunder came from the sea like a gun of distress. "'The monsoon breaks up early this year,' he remarked conversationally, somewhere behind me. This encouraged me to turn round, which I did as soon as I had finished addressing the last envelope. He was smoking greedily in the middle of the room, and though he heard the stir I made, he remained with his back to me for a time. "'Come, I carried it off pretty well,' he said, wheeling suddenly. "'Something's paid off. Not much. I wonder what's to come.' His face did not show any emotion, only it appeared a little darkened and swollen, as though he had been holding his breath— he smiled reluctantly, as it were, and went on while I gazed up at him mutely. "'Thank you, though. Your room. Jolly convenient for a chap badly hipped.' The rain pattered and swished in the garden. A water-pipe, it must have had a hole in it, performed just outside the window a parody of blubbering woe, with funny sobs and gurgling lamentations interrupted by jerky spasms of silence. "'A bit of shelter,' he mumbled, and ceased. A flash of faded lightning darted in through the black framework of the windows, and ebbed out without any noise. I was thinking how I had best approach him. I did not want to be flung off again. When he gave a little laugh, no better than a vagabond now, the end of the cigarette smouldered between his fingers. Without a single, single, he pronounced slowly. And yet, he paused. The rain fell with redoubled violence. Some day, one's bound to come upon some sort of chance to get it all back again. Must, he whispered distinctly glaring at my boots. I did not even know what it was he wished so much to regain, what it was he had so terribly missed. It might have been so much that it was impossible to say. A piece of ass's skin, according to Chester. He looked up at me inquisitively. Perhaps, uh, if life's long enough, I muttered through my teeth with unreasonable animosity. Don't reckon too much on it. Jove, I feel as if nothing could ever touch me, he said in a tone of sombre conviction. If this business couldn't knock me over, then there's no fear of there being not enough time to, to climb out. And he looked upwards. It struck me that it is from such as he that the great army of waifs and strays is recruited, the army that marches down, down, into all the gutters of the earth. As soon as he left my room, that bit of shelter, he would take his place in the ranks and begin the journey toward the bottomless pit. I, at least, had no illusions. 
but it was I, too, who a moment ago had been so sure of the power of words, and now was afraid to speak, in the same way one dares not move for fear of losing a slippery hold. It is when we try to grapple with another man's intimate need that we perceive how incomprehensible, wavering, and misty are all the beings that share with us the sight of the stars and the warmth of the sun. It is as if loneliness were a hard and absolute condition of existence. The envelope of flesh and blood on which our eyes are fixed melts before the outstretched hand, and there remains only the capricious, unconsolable, and elusive spirit that no eye can follow, no hand can grasp. It was the fear of losing him that kept me silent, for it was borne upon me suddenly, and with unaccountable force, that should I let him slip away into the darkness, I would never forgive myself. Well, thanks once more. You've been uh, uncommonly... Really, there's no word to... Uh, uncommonly. I don't know why, I am sure. I'm afraid I don't feel as grateful as I would if the whole thing hadn't been so brutally sprung on me. Because at bottom you yourself he stuttered. Possibly, I struck in. He frowned. All the same, one is responsible. He watched me like a hawk. And that's true, too, I said. Well, I've gone with it to the end, and I don't intend to let any man cast it in my teeth without, without resenting it. He clenched his fist. "'There's yourself,' I said, with a smile. "'Mirthless enough, God knows. "'But he looked at me menacingly. "'That's my business,' he said. "'An air of indomitable resolution came and went upon his face "'like a vain and passing shadow. "'Next moment he looked a dear good boy in trouble as before. "'He flung away the cigarette. "'Good-bye,' he said, with the sudden haste of a man, who had lingered too long in view of a pressing bit of work waiting for him. And then, for a second or so, he made not the slightest movement. The downpour fell with the heavy, uninterrupted rush of a sweeping flood, with a sound of unchecked, overwhelming fury that called to one's mind the images of collapsing bridges, of uprooted trees, of undermined mountains. No man could breast the colossal and headlong stream that seemed to break and swirl against the dim stillness in which we were precariously sheltered as if on an island. The perforated pipe gurgled, choked, spat, and splashed in odious ridicule of a swimmer fighting for his life. "'It is raining,' I remonstrated. "'And I—' "'Rain or shine,' he began brusquely, checked himself, and walked to the window." perfect deluge, he muttered after a while. He leaned his forehead on the glass. It's dark, too. Yes, it is very dark, I said. He pivoted on his heels, crossed the room, and had actually opened the door leading into the corridor before I leaped up from my chair. Wait, I cried. I, I want you to— I can't dine with you again tonight, he flung at me, with one leg out of the room already. "'I haven't the slightest intention to ask you,' I shouted. At this he drew back his foot, but remained mistrustfully in the very doorway. I lost no time in entreating him earnestly not to be absurd, to come in and shut the door. CHAPTER Seventeen. He came in at last, but I believe it was mostly the rain that did it. It was falling just then with a devastating violence which quieted down gradually while we talked. His manner was very sober and set. His bearing was that of a naturally taciturn man possessed by an idea. My talk was of the material aspect of his position. It had the sole aim of saving him from the degradation, ruin, and despair that out there closed so swiftly upon a friendless, homeless man. I pleaded with him to accept my help. I argued reasonably, and every time I looked up at that absorbed, smooth face, so grave and youthful, I had a disturbing sense of being no help, but rather an obstacle to some mysterious, inexplicable, impalpable striving of his wounded spirit. 
I suppose you intend to eat and drink and to sleep under shelter in the usual way, I remember saying with irritation. You say you won't touch the money that is due to you. He came as near as his sort can to making a gesture of horror. There were three weeks and five days' pay owing to him as mate of the Patna. Well, that's too little to matter anyhow, but what will you do tomorrow? Where will you turn? You must live. That isn't the thing, was the comment that escaped him under his breath. I ignored it and went on combating what I assumed to be the scruples of an exaggerated delicacy. On every conceivable ground, I concluded, you must let me help you. You can't, he said very simply and gently, and holding fast to some deep idea, which I could detect shimmering like a pool of water in the dark, but which I despaired of ever approaching near enough to fathom. I surveyed his well-proportioned bulk. At any rate, I said, I am able to help what I can see of you. I don't pretend to do more. He shook his head sceptically without looking at me. I got very warm. But I can, I insisted. I can do even more. I am doing more. I am trusting you. The money, he began. Upon my word, you deserve being told to go to the devil, I cried, forcing the note of indignation. He was startled, smiled, and I pressed my attack home. It isn't a question of money at all. You are too superficial, I said. And at the same time I was thinking to myself, well, here goes. And perhaps he is, after all. Look at the letter I want you to take. I'm writing to a man of whom I've never asked a favor, and I'm writing about you in terms that one only ventures to use when speaking of an intimate friend. I make myself unreservedly responsible for you. That's what I am doing. And really, if you will only reflect a little what that means— He lifted his head. The rain had passed away. Only the water-pipe went on, shedding tears with an absurd drip-drip outside the window. It was very quiet in the room, whose shadows huddled together in corners, away from the still flame of the candle, flaring upright in the shape of a dagger. His face, after a while, seemed suffused by a reflection of a soft light, as if the dawn had already broken. "'Jove!' he gasped out. "'It is noble of you!' Had he suddenly put out his tongue at me in derision, I could not have felt more humiliated. I thought to myself, serve me right for a sneaking humbug. His eyes shone straight into my face, but I perceived it was not a mocking brightness. All at once he sprang into jerky agitation, like one of those flat wooden figures that are worked by a string. His arms went up, then came down with a slap. He became another man altogether. "'And I had never seen!' he shouted, then suddenly bit his lip and frowned. "'What a bally ass I've been!' he said, very slow, in an awed tone. "'You are a brick!' he cried, next, in a muffled voice. He snatched my hand as though he had just then seen it for the first time, and dropped it at once. "'Why, this is what I—' "'You—' "'I—' he stammered, and then, with a return of his old, stolid, I may say mulish manner, he began heavily, "'I would be a brute now if I—' and then his voice seemed to break. "'That's all right,' I said. I was almost alarmed by this display of feeling, through which pierced a strange elation. I had pulled the string accidentally, as it were. I did not fully understand the working of the toy. "'I must go now,' he said. "'Jove, you have helped me. Can't sit still. The very thing,' he looked at me with puzzled admiration. "'The very thing!' Of course, it was the thing. It was ten to one that I had saved him from starvation, of that peculiar sort that is almost invariably associated with drink. This was all. I had not a single illusion on that score, but looking at him I allowed myself to wonder at the nature of the one he had within the last three minutes so evidently taken into his bosom. I had forced into his hands the means to carry on decently the serious business of life, 
to get food, drink, and shelter of the customary kind, while his wounded spirit, like a bird with a broken wing, might hop and flutter into some hole to die quietly of inanition there. This is what I had thrust upon him, a definitely small thing, and, behold, by the manner of its reception it loomed in the dim light of the candle like a big, indistinct, perhaps a dangerous shadow. "'You don't mind me not saying anything appropriate,' he burst out. "'There isn't anything one could say. Last night already you had done me no end of good. Listening to me, you know. I give you my word, I've thought more than once that the top of my head would fly off.' He darted, positively darted, here and there, rammed his hands into his pockets, jerked them out again, flung his cap on his head. I had no idea it was in him to be so airily brisk. I thought of a dry leaf imprisoned in an eddy of wind, while a mysterious apprehension, a load of indefinite doubt, weighed me down in my chair. He stood stock still, as if struck motionless by a discovery. "'You have given me confidence,' he declared soberly. "'Oh, for God's sake, my dear fellow, don't!' I entreated, as though he had hurt me. "'All right. I'll shut up now, and henceforth. Can't prevent me thinking, though. Never mind. I'll show yet.' He went to the door in a hurry, paused with his head down, and came back, stepping deliberately. "'I always thought that if a fellow could begin with a clean slate, and now you—' In a measure, yes, clean slate. I waved my hand, and he marched out without looking back. The sound of his footfalls died out gradually behind the closed door, the unhesitating tread of a man walking in broad daylight. But as to me, left alone with the solitary candle, I remained strangely unenlightened. I was no longer young enough to behold at every turn the magnificence that besets our insignificant footsteps in good and in evil. I smiled to think that, after all, it was yet he of the two of us who had the light. And I felt sad. A clean slate, did he say, as if the initial word of each our destiny were not graven in imperishable characters upon the face of a rock. End of chapters 15, 16, and 17